Hey, um, I hope everybody can see and uh, hear me today. Uh, my name is Stuart Lane. Um, I'm the chair of Sesimo's um, Additive Manufacturing Committee. I'd just like to welcome everybody uh, participating uh, in this webinar today, guests and panelists, and also a big thank you to Sesimo for um, putting the whole event on. Um, we're here to speak about um, EU industrial strategy and additive manufacturing, uh, increasing uh, the resilience of industrial ecosystems. Um, before I start, um, I just want to mention that we will be joined at some point today by Ms. Ulla Engelman, who is the Acting uh, Director General for Internal Market uh, Industry Entrepreneurship and SMEs. So at the appropriate point in the agenda, we will pass over to her to hear her presentation. I'm hoping that she'll be joining us in about half an hour. Um, before we get on to the uh, on today's subject, I'm just going to give you a, a brief overview of Sesimo and what we do. Uh, try and give a context around today's discussions, um, and then after a brief uh, brief speech, I'll be moving on to our today's panelists. Uh, that I would like to offer a very warm welcome to this morning. Okay, so first of all, uh, let me briefly introduce uh, Sesimo. We're an umbrella trade association uh, founded in 1950 that represents uh, the common interests and values of uh, additive manufacturing, uh, the machine tool industry, and also related manufacturing technologies. And that is at a EU and global level. We help European industry define strategies, improve leadership, global competitiveness, and promote their development uh, in fields of the economy, technology, um, and innovation. It is our proximity to industry and the strength of our membership that enables us to understand its challenges. And if we take additive manufacturing industry as an example, um, uh, industries that we understand uh, the issues that matter. And if we look at additive industry, uh, additive manufacturing in particular, the, uh, the areas that we focus on, which we believe are currently blocking growth um, of, of AM business, are things like production capacity, regulatory and non-regulatory barriers, funding, from R&D through to scalability and production, uh, license patents and IPR issues. There's a lot of talk about that at the moment. Uh, we also work on uh, standardization certification and um, advising around the skills shortage. Our mission is to promote the additive manufacturing sector and raise awareness to policymakers and other relevant stakeholders of the challenges and benefits it brings. Uh, this year, Sesimo will be attending uh, EMO from the 4th to the 9th of October in Milan, Italy. And as I hope you're all aware, EMO is one of the world's leading trade fairs for metalworking. And we're really pleased to have the opportunity to promote additive manufacturing at the show and discuss latest uh, the latest technology trends. Uh, during EMO, we'll be holding a international conference on additive manufacturing, the ICAM, where we'll focus on the latest solutions and applications of uh, hybrid uh, manufacturing. Uh, moreover, Sesimo, in partnership with AITA, the Italian Association of AM, uh, will be having a booth at the fairground dedicated to the promotion of the technology. Um, if you are there, please take the time to come and see us. You'd be more than welcome. Uh, We'll also take the opportunity at the show to highlight the importance of training, education, and skills dedicated to AM uh, by involving uh, universities there and, and also uh, European Union sponsored projects. And in that respect, we will be presenting our, our own sponsored project, the um, SAM project, a blueprint for sectorial cooperation on skills for additive manufacturing in which Sesimo is the communication lead. So once again, please take the opportunity to join us if you can. And now on to today's topic for discussion. Um, COVID-19 crisis 
that has had a huge impact on the single market. And Europe has faced challenges in a number of areas, uh, such as disruption uh, in the free movement of people, goods and services. Um, and also, uh, we've seen poor coordination and information sharing on restrictions. Disruption to supply chains has been occurring, uh, and we have seen, certainly in the beginning of the pandemic, uh, a lack of essential products, uh, particularly in the healthcare sector where demand was so high. And therefore, the uh, European Commission uh, decided that there was an updated review of the European industrial strategy was needed. And today, we would like to discuss how additive manufacturing can contribute to its changes and implementation. Sesimo believes that the industrial strategy is going in the right direction. It represents an important step for a more ambitious European industrial policy, an excellent opportunity to foster the development and adoption of key technologies, including additive manufacturing, of course, in the different industrial ecosystems. On several occasions, Sesimo has underlined that stakeholders, collaborators and partners are fundamental factors for developing strong business ecosystems and fostering industrial recovery. We are very happy that the European Commission has embraced this approach with the newly established industrial forum. We look forward to contributing to the realization of the common roadmap for the next generation of launchers within the European Alliance on Space Launchers, where we are sure AM can play a major role. Next slide, I think, Richard, there we go. According to the Joint Research Center report on critical raw materials for strategic technologies and sectors in the EU, the EU has a relatively strong position in metal-based additive manufacturing for aerospace applications. However, if the EU wants to consolidate the leadership in this ecosystem and others, like energy, healthcare, and automotive, it will be crucial to invest in technology development, market uptake, standardization, and skills. But more needs to be done to ensure that key technologies, such additive manufacturing, can become a European success story. The Joint Research Centre report has also highlighted shortcomings, including raw material supply, which must be addressed as soon as possible. Many technologies will face major raw, raw material demand increases, leading to supply chain disruption in many sectors. This issue should be addressed as soon as possible by the Commission and discussed in the Raw Material Alliance to investigate the new material innovation partnerships and foster the use of recycled materials in particular. We believe that the EU can continue to be an innovator and leader in the field of AM without losing this technology race with international competitors. As Europe moves past the most accurate phase of the pandemic and starts to plan for recovery, more businesses will look to the supply chain's reliability with new ways to mitigate production risks and increase sustainability. The integration of AM can provide flexibility and give access to on-demand solutions, allowing an easier substitution or repair of parts, as well as on-site production of critical items. It is necessary to look at how AM contributes to make critical sectors such as energy construction, medical and aerospace more resilient and sustainable. On that note, we will discuss this with our key speakers today. We will be hearing from uh, Mr. David Ikoveli, who is the Regional Director of EMEA EOS, Anita Kanhan Sajaji, Project Leader at Equinor, Maurits Pino, uh, Policy Officer at DG Grow at the European Commission, and also, as mentioned before, Ms. Ulla Engelman, Acting Director for Networks and Governance, DG Grow, European Commission. 
Thank you very much for your attention. And I will now pass the floor over to David. Thank you, David. Welcome. And um, I look forward to hearing your presentation. Thank you very much, Stuart. Uh, I will share my screen. I hope you can see my screen. We can. All right. Great. So thank you very much again, Stuart. Uh, it's a great pleasure to speak to you. My name is uh, Davide Iacovelli. I'm regional director of, uh, responsible for EMEA at EOS. And today I would like to share with you how additive manufacturing can leverage innovation and resilience in production and in supply chains. Uh, first of all, allow me to introduce also EOS. So who, who is EOS? The EOS is the technology market leader in industrial 3D printing solution. And why I'm emphasizing solution because it's more than just a metal and polymer system, it's uh, materials, uh, it's software, it's service, and it's consulting what we offer. We have more than 30 years of experience. Uh, we have uh, the, biggest, the biggest installed base worldwide with uh, more than currently 3,700 system. Roughly the half polymer and the half metal systems. Uh, we have an international customer footprint uh, across 68 countries, and currently we have 1,300 employees. Uh, I would like to remind what are the uh, three main and key advantages of additive manufacturing in comparison to traditional manufacturing. Uh, it's freedom of design. So. Um, to produce complex uh, structures, uh, bionic structures, uh, leveraging lightweight uh, structures, and also um, cost efficient small series, so lot size one, mass customization. Um, this is all, let's say, under the, 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 the cluster of freedom of design. Second key pillar is freedom of materials, as Stuart already mentioned, uh, recyclable materials. Uh, there will be also new more performing materials, new metal alloys, advanced polymers, and uh, what we call digital materials. Uh, this will allow us in future to influence mechanical properties on a voxel base. Um, so great uh, stuff ahead. And last not least, it's a freedom of manufacturing, which is also a very important key pillar. Um, and here we are talking, and that's what I will also uh, show in the next slide, digital manufacturing, distributed manufacturing as key um, added value of the um, additive manufacturing technology. So, and uh, what I would like to show here is we have more and more also customer which are, are following our vision and are implementing additive manufacturing in their series production. Uh, our vision is that AM is a key technology for advanced um, uh, industrial production and is the key technology for digital production. And as you can see, we have uh, four, we have identified four main areas, uh, which is air and space enablement, human hearing, uh, efficient energy and production and advanced mobility. Um, what I would like also to show you more concretely is to deep dive into maybe one, two examples. According to the time, I will do it uh, very fast. Uh, you can see we have a, uh, also along these four clusters that I mentioned before, of course, the different and uh, also um, several success stories coming from the spare part uh, business in advanced mobility to also air and space uh, topic, which I will show in the next slide, but also in the human hearing and uh, in advanced production, we have a really great example to show and to share. And please uh, feel free also to contact me at the end of the session. One example that I want uh, to show you today is an example of a part a LED shaft. It's a part of the door of the Airbus 8350. It's a safety class two component. So it means really high requirements. It's a part uh, produced in titanium uh, on an M44 multi-laser system of EOS. What are key uh, benefits and key, uh, key, uh, the key outcome of these uh, uh, 3D printed part, as you can see on the left hand side, uh, we have uh, achieved a weight reduction of 45% uh, and a cost reduction of 25%. Uh, and what is important uh, also in terms of functional integration, what I mentioned before, 
as you can see also in the picture on the bottom side, traditionally Spark consists in, in 10 components and uh, we achieve to print this part in one component. So from 10 conventional parts to one 3D printed part. Um, and each, each plane consists in 16 net shafts. So you can also see here um, the, the added value behind at lower costs. But this is just from the one hand, if you look on the customer side, then as you can see also on the right hand side, we are also talking about uh, fuel cost reduction. Uh, and we estimate that uh, roughly 20,000 US dollar per plane can be achieved as a fuel cost reduction. And if you take into consideration the complete airplane uh, fleet, which is, uh, which is about uh, more than 900 planes, then we are coming at 19, 90.1 million euro for um, uh, cost reduction, fuel cost reduction. And more than that, we also have a CO2 reduction, a significant CO2 reduction. So here we can also see the sustainable aspect of additive manufacturing, which I will also emphasize in the next slide. Maybe to give you also a time information. So that's uh, nothing which takes year. Uh, indeed, uh, we were able to, uh, with Airbus, on a very close cooperation with Airbus, from the part selection to the ramp up, uh, to do this uh, in, in nine months. So that's uh, also give you a, an indication on how fast uh, uh, with a very close end-to-end -end comparison with the customer, we can implement this technology and come to first results. Maybe more um, short uh, uh, examples on the polymer side, actually three main topics I would like to emphasize here. First topic is it's about innovation and it's not just copying a conventional part and 3d print a part it uh, doesn't make sense to just to to print uh, to 3d print a block so it's about rethinking redesigning think out of the box uh, and as you can see also here in the middle that's uh, exactly what happened that's a conventional part um, of a robot gripper uh, which has been completely redesigned uh, and uh, by redesigning, we could achieve 50% lower cost and 80% faster production time. So really significant uh, benefits here. And last not least, uh, the third uh, topic I would like to emphasize is uh, additive manufacturing and maybe it's perceived also as a, a production and a technology for small series. This is uh, what we can, uh, let's say, also show you here. That's not the case. Indeed, uh, uh, I think one of the uh, most famous applications in the consumer good and human earring sector is the, the mascara brush. And currently we are producing, producing, we produced 18 million of parts. And on the bottom side, you also can see that there are completely also different models behind uh, possible. So scan to print, uh, where we have here insoles, 100,000 parts could be produced also on a digital way. More parts, of course, on also on the metal side. Uh, due to the time, time, I will not stick to this. Uh, um, yeah, um, but of course, uh, really looking forward to ending this discussion at the later stage. Um, this is a picture from Siemens AM factory in the UK, uh, and the one statement of Siemens which I would like to share with you was: that if you can print a turbine blade, then you can print much, pretty much uh, anything. I totally agree. The uh, possibility of the technology are really unlimited. However, we also see some macro uh, um, uh, topics like Corona. So Corona came. What? Uh, how did Corona influence and impact on additive manufacturing? That's something that I would like to share with you um, in this slide. So we could see that in the medical technology and in the med medical sector in particular, uh, AM has gained momentum uh, to overcome supply uh, uh, difficulties and help to focus on supply chain resilience. And how did we do this? Actually, uh, by uh, four main activities. Bridge, so we, we help to provide essential products like face shields and uh, also nasal swaps. By adapting, so it means we support it to, to retrofit existing equipment to repurpose them, um, and third, accelerate, so to speed up, to accelerate technical innovation and their market launch, 
for example, through rapid tooling, traditional manufacturing, um, uh, of course, uh, especially for complex parts which are difficult to be uh, procured. And last, uh, last not least, last not least, also um, to digitize critical parts and products uh, for more resilience global global supply chains. Uh, um, for example, or digital warehouse, and uh, also in order to gain more flexibility in assets. This is just showing you an overview. As I said, uh, additive manufacturing can drive this paradigm shift from large centralized factories to globally distributed centers of manufacturing. So global production from global production networks to localized production networks and local supply chains uh, with a local warehouse. And maybe an important slide. Uh, so how can we do this? How can AM support this paradigm shift? We believe through uh, four main topics, digital value chain, just to um, uh, emphasize here one topic, digital twins. So we are moving from physical assets to digital assets, allowing us to redesign, rethink uh, not only product, but also processing and complete ecosystem. Digital inventory, as I mentioned before, spare parts on demand, reduce warehouse costs, distributed manufacturing, that's exactly what I mentioned, from, uh, uh, from large uh, centralized uh, factories to globally distributed uh, centers of manufacturing. And last not least, also very important for us as EOS, as a company, responsible manufacturing, that's a key driver and our key vision. Um, and here we can see that the uh, technology can leverages, leverage uh, more resilient supply chain, less material waste, um, and sustainable production. I would like to step one uh, step back, last slide. So how can we do this? So what is important to be able to leverage and to uh, take benefit of these uh, four main topics? Of course. Uh, the maturity and technology, uh, technolo technical readiness, it's key, it's important. So we need systems which are faster, more productive, but that's only one uh, side of the medal. We believe that it's also very important and crucial to transfer the know-how um, and uh, yeah, um, to think in new application, to identify new application and to optimize new application. We can support our customer by doing so. We have uh, a um, consulting group which help our customer and guide our customer through uh, a, the AM journey in order to achieve organizational readiness and technology readiness. Um, so, and um, just the last, the last picture. So this is our group of experts which drew, uh, drove already more than 400 uh, successful projects. So, uh, and this shows it's, it's possible, it's possible to implement uh, the technology and to leverage this, those uh, benefits, which I mentioned before. Happy to discuss this uh, more in detail in, uh, at the end of the, our webinar. And of course, you can reach me out also after the, uh, the event, looking forward to, to contact with you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, David. Uh, some really nice case studies there. I really appreciate uh, the insight that you've given us. Thank you very much. Thank we you. will return to you in the questions section that comes after the presentations. Thank you once again. We now move on to our next presenter, who is Pantia Kanzhajhaji, uh, project lead at Equinor. Pantia, you are welcome, and I look forward to seeing your presentation. Thank you very much. Hello, and good morning, everybody. As I'm going to share my presentation. <clears throat> Are you able to see my presentation now? We can see your presentation, but we're seeing the, uh, yeah, that's right. I think that's great. Thank you. Okay, excellent. Just give me a moment and I was ready. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, very nice to, to be part of this uh, webinar. It was a great presentation, David. I enjoyed it a lot. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, today I'm calling from Oslo, uh, from the Equinor office. Equinor is the biggest energy company in Norway. And uh, today is quite nice and warm in Norway, uh, which I believe that it is in many other places. But this is actually a point to, uh, to a problem that the world is facing, and that's the global warming. What is the biggest concern these days in, uh, in the world is that we are using lots of material. Every year we are using 10, uh, 100 billion tons of material, which this number just two years ago was around 91 million. And we are only able to recycle 8.6%, which last time I checked that was 9%. That means that we are going to a wrong direction. We are going to use lots of lots of material and <clears throat> they're not able to recycle them. Uh, what does that mean is that uh, we're going in future for just doing the, the getting our supply, we're going to have a problem because we already get and use what was easy to get and use. And to do that in a more cost-effective way in future and also meet the environmental challenges, we're going to have a problem. On the other hand, to get to net zero from the, looking from the energy perspective company, uh, to get to net zero, we need to, to shift to, to the cleaner energy. And to do that, actually, we're gonna need much more material if we're gonna net, go to the net zero by 2050, we almost need six times more mineral than we need today. So how are we going to get all those material that we needed? And the question is not that we have enough material, but the question is that if we afford to get all of that in the price that we want and when we need it. And last year we had this COVID situation that uh, showed us that it's, it's not really easy to access what we need with the, all this border restriction and in the interruption in the global supply chain and this uh, disruption of the demand. So we see the bigger problem there, what we need to do to get this geographically independent uh, supply. One more thing that I would like also to uh, mention as a concern is that 31% of the global gas uh, emission is coming from manufacturing. And that's the biggest portion that's higher than uh, gas, uh, um, <clears throat> sorry, electricity. <clears throat> so by looking at that bigger picture and want to get to net zero, I would like to see that how additive manufacturing and 3D printing can be a part of the solution to get to net zero. <clears throat> this is how Equinor, this is the corporate strategy for Equinor to get to net zero. So basically what we look at is to how we can <clears throat> do more carbon efficiency, how we can get more renewable, grow in more renewable and also accelerate the decarbonization. Just imagine if you want to get rid of your weight, one of the uh, things you can do is to still eat and then use the uh, treadmill to get use of and to get rid of your weight. This is the, how we do the carbon efficiency. So we try to um, <clears throat> get rid of the the scope one emission that we are um, making. And then, sorry, wrong direction. <laughs> the other thing you can actually grow. Uh, in, in renewable, well, that means that you start eating different to get rid of that. So you, you look at the substitute, that, that's a renewable way of looking at this. And the other thing is, the more important thing is how to avoid eating if you want to lose weight. And this is actually where we can put the point on that in many of the energy companies, because we are not looking at this very precisely, how to avoid uh, uh, a meeting and not just our own emission, but others, supplier and other uh, parties emission, the scope three emission of the other uh, group. Uh, and this is basically where additive manufacturing can have the biggest effect. When we are looking at, when we are talking about the digital, <clears throat> the, the, the 3D printing, what we actually look at is mostly the physical part of AM and not the digital side and, and the business model. But the moment we can do the 3D print anything, that's a moment we are capable of 
digitalizing the supply network as well. So that's where the digital and physical uh, world can meet together. So basically, if we are able to set up the digital supply network, that's the moment that we are actually start sending the files and not part, and that's we can transform the world inventory. If you just imagine for any production to be in a cheaper price, you need to do the massive production, and then you need to do it in a, like a cheaper place there, which has mostly higher CO2 in intensity, and then ship it to where you need it, and then keep it until it needed. So wait and uh, up to up to needed. So it, it's lots of overcapacity of using material, overcapacity of using the uh, the warehouses that need it, and this is not necessary at all. The example of Equinor is that we are <clears throat> having a large physical inventory worth around three billion euros. And, and then like you have to pay like two, three person just for the maintaining that cost. And, and all of that is not necessary if you're able to, uh, to make this digital network so you can shift from just in case to just in time. And by doing that, you know, you're avoiding lots of lots of emissions that coming just from, you know, mining all those material, keeping them and shipping them. So it's, it's, it's a huge difference uh, in the world. And, and that in the bigger picture is actually going from the low competence and high staffing country and, and type of working to high competence and low staffing. And this is kind of moving to the home uh, kind of sourcing, like shifting the um, production, for example, to Europe. So instead of importing, we could do like service and then the local <clears throat> production in Norway. Uh, when we are looking at the, when we are talking about the circular economy, normally we think about, okay, this is how we can do the waste management. But I believe this circular economy has quite a big, uh, you know, additive manufacturing has a big uh, contribution to the circular economy and not just by waste, by, by management, uh, the waste, but also from each part of this and the cycle, uh, it's designing the waste and pollution out. And then it's, it's make the product and material more in use and regenerate in the system. So the first thing is that by shifting to, to additive manufacturing, the first action is that we are going to use less and less material and we are gonna have less and less waste. And that's this hundred billion tons that can reduce, it come to the fraction of it. Shifting to the digital network, we are going to avoid all this huge uh, inventory and, and, and overcapacity production. <clears throat> when it's come to the consumption, for example, in Equino, we're able to do lots of repair and replace the part, and the part rather than the whole equipment. And then basically you're gonna reuse and, uh, and extend the lifetime of all those material compared to just throw it away and buy new stuff. <clears throat> so, and then at the end of the recycling, basically at the end of the, uh, the cycle, we are able to recycle the material. So what we do, we are using all the um, uh, scrap metal that for example, we used in our platform and turn it to the 3D printing material. Uh, and feedstock, and then we can use it. So the whole uh, circle of the circular economy at manufacturing actually meet that. But the most important element in additive manufacturing is the business model uh, that we're using. I would like to quote the Buckminster Fuller uh, about that. It says that you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing one obsolete. And that's exactly what we need to do for adopting the uh, circular economy model for the additive manufacturing and make the ecosystem work. As long as, for example, we have a different ambition in the ecosystem, different part of that, think about different uh, model of, and, and having a different reward system, and it works, it's going to be very hard to, to make it happen. But if the whole ecosystem is going to have the same ambition, ambition of 
you know, reducing all the emission and be effectively working and then changing the, the business model, then we can do this together. I just give an example, for example, for the supplier, building and selling and make the absolute, it is basically, is their business model, the need to sell more, but how we can make sure that this is not going to happen. How can, for example, the policymaker bring out the policy that kind of avoid this? So, for example, put some sort of the incentive for, for repairing, put some sort of the penalty or taxes for the using the virgin material. And then at the end of the day, how, for example, end user can, can be there. Instead of buying all those material, they can, they can subscribe to this and then kind of share the business model together with the supplier. So to work, to, to, to make sure that this can work, I think the whole ecosystem need to work. And this is something that we need for that is, is the complementary innovation, which is innovation in technology, but also in the commercial model and in the policy that we are making. And this is kind of a step-by-step -step, uh, way. Until you've got one minute left. Yeah, I, I, I don't need that one minute. So you can, <laughs> I, I think I, I covered this. Thanks. Thank you. Well, that was perfect. Thank you very much. <laughs> right on time. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's really well done. Thank you. Um, right, do we move on to? We, we will. Uh, thank you very much for that presentation. Some really interesting insights there. Uh, you certainly got me thinking. Um, uh, we'll now move on to Marit Pino, who is the policy officer for the European Commission. Uh, Director General, Director General for Internal Market Industry, Entrepreneurship, SMEs, Strategy and Economic Analysis. The floor is yours, Marit. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for to Cecimo for inviting me, and thank you to David and Patea for uh, very interesting uh, uh, talks. I'm gonna yeah do a bit of a step or two away from uh, additive manufacturing. Um, I have a very general talk, but I think many of its many of its ideas are extremely relevant, uh, especially because you guys tend to be so much on the on the edge of these technological developments. Good. In March 2020, the Commission published a new industrial strategy for Europe, along with a dedicated SME strategy and other specific actions for the single market. Our strategy aims to support the twin transition towards a climate neutral and digital EU economy, make EU industry more competitive globally and enhance Europe's open strategic autonomy. Our ambitions have not changed, but the situation has. The pandemic hit the European economy very hard, and while the recovery has already started, it rise across industrial ecosystems. Therefore, we published in May, this year, an update. We emphasize there the need to strengthen the resilience of our single market. Second, the need to analyze and address strategic dependencies. And thirdly, the need to accelerate the trend transition and support its business case. So I'm gonna go through each of the three uh, uh, points in a bit more detail. The single market is the EU's most important asset, offering certainty, scale, and global springboard for our companies. Disruption severely affected its functioning during the crisis. Think of the difficulties, least perhaps for capital, not so much for goods, but definitely for services, for workers to cross borders, even apart from all the uh, export controls that countries had sometimes for no particularly good reason. All of it made a mess to, um, uh, to supply chains that tend to be super decentralized. And it was not good. And we hope to have a solution, a legal solution to let's say protect legitimate interests of member states, but then also to protect everybody else, not to have one member state protecting itself at the expense of others. Good. We propose a single market emergency instrument, a structural solution that will ensure the free movement of goods and services if and when other European wide crises happen and pursue efforts to step up market surveillance in critical areas. 
My second issue is strategic dependencies. We were made very much aware of uh, the dependence that we have on other economies in this crisis. We went on to analyze these uh, dependencies from a number of different angles. The first one, and the most visible one, in a certain sense, was a complete bottom-up procedure. We looked at trade data, production inside Europe, and we came up in this initial analysis with 137 products in which we are strategically dependent on some other country. A combination of low owned production with high imports from a very small number of sources. And then I would like to ask you to move to the next slide temporarily. Yes, our strategic dependence is mostly from three countries, as you can see here, China, Vietnam, and Brazil. And all the rest is sort of secondary to this. By the way, we've done the analysis also for the US, and it's a very similar pattern to what we see. And there, uh, and there, their dependence is a bit higher than ours in general. Okay, these conclusions are very, very preliminary. Um, we've taken up this list of 137 goods, and we're talking to all sorts of sectoral uh, specialists. And we see interesting things. For example, when you talk to pharmaceutical uh, uh, experts, in some member states, they will say that one of those 137 products that we identified with the bottom-up procedure is extremely critical to them because the only way to produce the medicine to deal with disease so-and-so requires that. And then in another member state, they say, no, no, we don't do this because we allow a certain other uh, medicine to, uh, um, to address that disease, to solve that disease. And we don't, don't need that good. So are we dependent? Yes, no, maybe. It is, the devil is very much in the details. Completely different example. Do you know about forest fires? The way they terrorize many of the Mediterranean countries in the past, nowadays also in Sweden and countries up north. There are planes that are able to scope up water and throw it on the burning forest. It's all very tricky. It's technically extremely, uh, extremely difficult. And there's only one producer of a plane that can really do this. And the producer has stopped producing those planes five years ago. We are strategically dependent and we don't even know on whom. All right, what can we do about strategic dependence? Well, we can listen, of course, to David and focus on more localized production. And he's got a very good point. I have a small list of things um, that, are, that, 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 that help that, to solve that problem as well. Diversification of suppliers, obviously. More recycling, as Pantea noticed. The more we recycle, the less we depend on, 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 on foreign suppliers. And I can tell you, there is some, some good news in this world. I, I was involved a couple of years ago in a big merger between um, uh, companies in the world of copper. Of all the copper ever mined in the world since the beginning of time, some 60% is currently in use. That's quite a serious figure. I mean, it also depends, of course, because the, the, the amount of copper used goes straight up. But we reuse, we recycle a lot of it. It's not possible for all materials, but copper gives us a nice example of how well this can be done. Good, recycling. Strategic stocks. It won't help us for long times, but having strategic stops, stocks protects us against sort of individual actions. Reshoring and nearshoring. Not sure these are, uh, I think these two are a bit of a uh, neologisms. Reshoring, bringing production back to the EU. Nearshoring, making sure that uh, countries very close to the EU do things that we cannot do ourselves and that we would have to bring away, to bring in from far away. Think about uh, Ukraine, Serbia, 
and strangely enough, Greenland, where there's apparently quite a bit of mining that we um, badly depend on. More in general, we need a functional, fully functional single market, my first uh, point this morning, and we need technological solutions. And there, of course, we should yeah, keep between the fine line of this sort of um, technological determinism, which turned out to be so bad. I mean, in the sense that 20 years ago, nobody uh, except the greatest visionaries and the greatest optimists uh, would know how good wind turbines would turn out to work. So, sorry, we have to keep the balance between uh, technological uh, uh, pessimism, determinism, and uh, uh, the thing that all, what, whatever the market needs will eventually be developed. No, whatever the market needs may be developed if companies see the needs, if um, the, the, the sufficient public uh, support exists for R&D and for engineering. It's not obvious, but we should focus on it. And I really appreciate Patea's point, who's been yeah, ramming this point home. We need it. And we need it soon. Good. Thirdly, um, the pandemic has drastically affected the speed and the scale of the transitions. The business case for the transition is stronger than ever. Ah, thank you. Yes. Our immediate opportunities are to accelerate the transition of in the recovery efforts. We assess carefully national recovery and resilience plans in this respective. And let me remind you, the European Commission made 600 billion available to the member states for the um, uh, uh, recovery and resilience plans in their totality. The investment of the national plan supported by the EU must consist for at least 37% of green investments and for at least 20% of digital investments. So far, for my side. Stuart, I have ended my... Did you... Thank you very much for that, uh, Marit. Thank you very much for that presentation. Uh, I'll just turn my camera on. Uh, thank you for giving us a, an oversight of some of the uh, the challenges that you see see us facing from from your side and the Commission side. That was very interesting. I believe that uh, Ms. Engelman is present now. So, uh, without further ado, I will hand over to her and. Uh, her presentation. Welcome. Hello, thank you very much. And I don't know because I have sent just my uh, presentation via email whether your colleague could uh, perfect <laughs> put it up. Thanks a lot. Uh, yeah, so um, additionally to what uh, my colleague uh, has already presented to you, I want to give you some uh, more insights. Uh, so let's go to the first uh, slide. Um, and there, of course, on the importance of the manufacturing industry in Europe, which for you and the participants here is probably no surprise. You, you are very well aware of, of the importance. Um, but um, I would want to put it also into perspective uh, on the key role in, in research and uh, innovation, because I think it, it is important and uh, that 64% uh, of private research sector development expenditure and 49% of innovation comes uh, from um, the private sector. And I think the link uh, about what we are talking uh, between research and innovation and uh, what you're doing is, is, is very important. And we want to strengthen and, and highlight uh, that this is one of the, the key parts we are looking at to. Um, then, of course, on, on the sector itself, um, about uh, the two million enterprises, uh, the more than uh, 2,000 billion, the 2 billion, uh, 2,000 billion gross value added and the 32.1 million jobs uh, which uh, are in the manufacturing. And I think on the jobs, I think this is another very important issue on the skills. Because um, if we can go uh, to the next slide, there we have pulled together 
um, where uh, the EU competitive positioning in additive manufacturing is. And I think if we now go maybe straight uh, to look at the challenges, uh, skills and education, I think this is something where uh, it is very important and also in view of the updated industrial strategy, because already in the uh, original industrial strategy paper published in March, uh, skills have been pointed out as an issue re and upskilling needs. And also that uh, we have for this, uh, together with our colleagues from DG Employment, what we call the Pact for Skills, where we are looking into what could be possibilities to re and upskill and also on the Pact for Skills, then to have this possibility to, to adhere to this Pact for Skills, to come up and see what possible partnerships uh, for re and upskilling. And I think this is something where I would also want to encourage you to, to really look at too, because this can open new opportunities. And I think this will be particularly interesting for your sector to, to look into. But of course, apart from skills and education, sustainability will be another challenge, which will be extremely important um, because due to the uh, energy uh, consumption, I think this is another challenge and uh, the lack of standardization. Whereas if we go to the strengths, the Europe is a, is a front runner uh, in metal and hybrid 3D printing. And the question is then what can we do to maintain this front runner position? And uh, I think these are probably questions you, you will be discussing here. And uh, also the ability uh, to create uh, complex and uh, custom uh, parts. I think uh, this is uh, something uh, where you can really make a difference and uh, the lightweight components. On the opportunities, um, there will be wider application areas and uh, also the way you can explore them and open uh, markets for this. And also looking at uh, other forms of hybrid parts and processes, this is another area where uh, opportunities can be created and expansion can happen. But on the risks, um, we are looking at the question of scarcity of raw materials, which not only in your area, but in, in many areas is, is an issue. And there we are also working uh, very intensively with our colleagues um, in different parts, like uh, the raw materials team is, is looking at um, different kind of uh, activities, uh, an action plan and what can be done. Also um, on the um, international competition, so that's something to, to be carefully looked at. And then of course also uh, the, the Brexit as UK was, uh, is very active in, in 3D printing. What uh, in the next slide, I just want to, uh, because this kind of uh, data and information we are also extracting from what we call the advanced technologies for industry monitor, because um, we, and I put the website here for you, uh, if, if you are interested uh, to, because we really would want you also to use the existing tools we make available because, we use it for, for policy making, but I think also for industry representatives, particularly on the statistical data, but also on the access to technology centers. This is something I would uh, want to encourage you to, to use it. And of course, they are also coming up uh, with events and workshops, uh, but I think um, particularly the access to technology center is something I wanted to, uh, to make you aware of. And then uh, in my last slide, I would want to uh, make you aware of the industrial forum because um, the industrial forum is also part of the updated industrial strategy. And it is a new inclusive and open mechanism for, for co-designing solutions. And uh, on one hand, we are looking at uh, the analysis of the ecosystem but also and assessing the risks and needs of industry and also 
what uh, on strategic dependencies, what was presented by my colleague before. So this is something where we want uh, the industrial form to contribute. But what I wanted to point out to you is also the twin transition, the green digital and strengthening the resilience for this together with the industrial forum, we are looking at what we call transition pathways. And the transition pathways are a key element of the industrial uh, strategy update. And within there, we are wanting to identify for the different ecosystems what are the areas uh, and what are the milestones to be reached and uh, what are the elements to be helped with the investment needs for this transition pathway. So this is really a crucial work which we are starting now, which we put on an interactive wiki, which will be open to all because this is also about the inclusive nature of the work of the industrial forum and I think then also for you to be able to see in which areas and uh, we will start in the energy in not to start we have started with the tourism um, ecosystem where we came up with scenarios a staff working document of the commission scenarios for the transition pathways which is of course less linked to your work but the next ones to come are on mobility and energy intensive industries and i think particularly and the energy intensive industries transition pathways i'm sure you have a lot to contribute so i encourage you to to follow this and as it is a co-creation process to also see and and also to see from your side how can you engage with it how can you be part of it what can be pledges for example you could think of so i think this is something uh, I wanted to, to make you aware of. And I also wanted to make you aware of that there was a request at the industrial forum because we have proposed uh, four um, working groups. And uh, additionally, there was one requested uh, by and supported by different forum members on advanced manufacturing. So there will be a fifth working group on advanced manufacturing. And I think this is of course, also particularly interesting for you. So I leave it uh, up uh, to this, to, to give you an overview of the latest developments, which come from my area where, uh, as I'm now the acting director for networks and governance within DG Grow. Thank you very much. And thank you, thank you very much, Mrs. Uh, Ms. Ingleman. Thank you very much for that um, uh, presentation and taking the time to join us today. Uh, right, we uh, will move on now from the uh, presentations to the open discussion and uh, questions to our, our panelists. Uh, I see that there are a number of um, questions coming up in the chat and uh, vincenzo uh, if you would kindly kindly uh, review those and pick out the ones that you would like to put to our panel um, i'd be very grateful while you're doing that um, i will put a few questions of my own to the panel if that's okay and i'm going to start with um I'm going to start with uh, David, if that's okay, from EOS. Um, David, uh, EOS are widely uh, promoting the role of AM in improving sustainability and supply chain resilience, and we saw that in your presentation today. Have you noticed a, uh, a shift in companies' requests and needs since uh, since last year? Uh, do you feel that companies are becoming more interested uh, in understanding the potential of this technology? You mean uh, related to, um, to sustainability and resilience or generally from a technological, technological perspective? I would say both. Okay. Thank you very much for the question. Yeah, maybe just to, to answer the first one. I mean, Yes, uh, we see also, let's say, that the topics, uh, sustainability uh, and also resilience of production, but also for supply chain is becoming, uh, uh, let's say, across and across the impact of COVID more and more important. 
um, not only for us, but for several companies along the industry. And it's also not a phenomenon which is related to additive manufacturing. But that's definitely it's 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 key. Um, it show us it help us to let's say be more in, independent uh, in terms of production, and it help us uh, also to have a let's say positive social impact on society, which uh, for us is also a very important uh, key value for the company. When it comes to technology, yeah, we see uh, that. Uh, uh, of course, as I, as I explained before, there are uh, topics which remain important, like uh, technical readiness of systems. So systems needs to be more and more reliable, robust, quicker. Of course, cost per part is driving also discussion, but it's only one part. Um, more and more customers are going into complete uh, solutions and thinking about also of new materials, um, circular economy is a topic which we also heard today. So it's also about uh, um, um, uh, biocompatible -comp and recyclable materials. These are the topics that uh, are coming more and more and where we are also in close cooperation with partners, uh, with, uh, with um, other companies in order to be able to offer these um, to our customers. And I think that's something that, uh, where I really see a difference. Also before COVID, this topic is really, really gaining uh, momentum and importance. Uh, and um, if you ask me, uh, I think these are really the, the important and, and crucial discussion that we need to leverage. Uh, uh, it's not only, let's say, faster, quicker, but it's also more sustainable and uh, also looking on, on the social impact and our responsibility. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, if I can call on uh, Pantia, please, from Equinor. Are you there? Yes. There we are. You haven't left us. <laughs> it's always good. Um, if I could ask you, Pantia, digital inventory, uh, freedom of design and on-demand production can be considered major uh, of major benefit value add to the oil and gas sector. Uh, what other challenges in your supply chain could be solved by additive manufacturing in the coming years, in your view? Yeah, I think first of all, what I would like to mention here is that we have to shift from this linear supply chain to the supply network. That's a big difference. So in this network, everybody be connected and and everybody have a role in this network or ecosystem, as I mentioned before. <clears throat> I think what we are discussing a lot, uh, especially in the energy companies, how the supplier need to do their part better. They need to bring this cheaper and better and more available. But what is important is the total cost of ownership and what is the role of each participant in this ecosystem, how we can have this uh, efficient ecosystem working. What we need to look at is where is the bottleneck and where is the opportunity that to make this uh, ecosystem more efficient. Like, for example, what, one thing we say is that, okay, we want to have to make the Europe, um, European market more strong. And by that, we need to have like a higher quality job. And then we have to have like lots of training. And uh, but, but, but if we don't get enough of those training, if we don't get enough innovation, then basically it's not going to happen in Europe. But basically anywhere else in the world, the people get those uh, kind of innovation and those training that they can come and get all those uh, jobs that we are doing. And for me, this is unavoidable. And this is not a bad thing. The, the whole world actually should kind of work together because the whole world is in this game to get to net zero. But what we need to do, we have to make sure that we have, like, as I said, to, to kind of help out to, to remove the bottleneck with, through, for example, the data sharing, through the uh, standardization. One thing I can make an example, I said that how we can avoid CO2 emission through additive manufacturing is, for example, to have like a standard way of looking at the life cycle assessment of, of the, the material we are using all in additive manufacturing and also in conventional and show that how much we are able to reduce all this emission 
using and shifting to additive manufacturing and how we can make sure that we get credit for that. So this is also kind of internally working in the in the company as long as well as the external. So there are the, the, we have to, to make sure that we see the big picture. We have to make sure that we see the role of every parties in the ecosystem. We make sure that we do this step by step and to the, together through the cooperation. Okay, thank you very much. Um, can I uh, come next on to uh, Maritz, please, from the Commission? Uh, are you there? There we are. That's great. Um, your question, uh, uh, Maritz, um, how will the uh, European Commission coordinate its work with member states to ensure that uh, the industrial strategy helps strengthen the single market and make supply chains more resilient in the future. So there are two, essentially two sides to this. The first is the single market emergency instrument for which we play need. A, yeah, we're working on a legal basis, how to prepare for future, let's say interruptions of the single market, whether caused by uh, by by um, uh, to call this natural disasters or whatever other source, that's one. The second is we talk to each other at the political level, three levels down all the time, in order to avoid this type of thing. Um, I give you a banal example. It's not exactly in this area, but effectively it is. The decision to share vaccines pro rata, pro rata, sorry, of the population, effectively made us all allies. There was no point anymore of keeping any production together. This type of thing brought the, re-established the single market in a perfect way. We were our, uh, how do you call this, our interests are perfectly aligned again. And you see how it happens now in the, uh, in, inside Europe, the uh, producers cooperate perfectly. Well, listen, the cooperation is, of course, pretty seriously good across uh, outside of the continent here as well, but within, smooth, no question whatsoever. Okay. Yep. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, if I may now move on to um, Ms. Engelman again, please. Um, uh, the question to you. Uh, we all agree that collaborations and partnerships can help with the implementation of the industrial strategy. What could the industrial sector do to help policymakers in the next phase of implementation? Thanks uh, for this question. And uh, I think uh, the question you are asking refers also for me very much uh, to the role which we have for the industrial forum because uh, there is where we really want to know from industry what what are the issues what are your your problems because uh, for evidence-based policies we, we we need to know uh, the fact and we need to have a, a dialogue and uh, the industrial form has this dialogue form because um, it, it is very important to get directly from the companies uh, the feedback uh, and uh, but also um, the solutions and I think this is also when when the crisis uh, started and um, we had uh, as, as it was also described uh, the disrupted uh, supply chains um, and, and not only is disrupted supply chains, also uh, just materials are missing like masks or so. We needed uh, very quickly uh, to, to do something. And there we, we got help. And, and uh, as we talk about uh, particularly 3D printing, um, we, we had this informal call and say, who can do some 3D printing on masks? Uh, and, uh, and we got in uh, three weeks, 1,100 offers uh, informally just by email say we can help. And uh, in, in Spain, where it, it was really an issue in the hospitals, um, they organized via uh, crowdfunding some of the industrial clusters 
got together with uh, 3D printing companies and they then transported uh, this uh, mask to the hospital. I mean, this was an excellent example by working together in, in a pretty informal way because we, we just right at the beginning sent this email saying, look, we have an issue, what can you do? And, and we got this overwhelming, uh, let's say, willingness of help and that we have to foster more. We have to think and to use the innovative, uh, the collective innovative power also of our companies, how, how to find solution, but then we need to find ways how we can share this because we might find an ecosystem specific solution, but it could be interesting also for another ecosystem to find ways how to transmit this message also between different ecosystems. And this is what we are trying to, to do with the industrial form. And that's why I'm also very pleased that industrial form pointed out, we need to particularly look at the potential of advanced manufacturing. And uh, this is an also real co-creation process, even if we as European Commission didn't have it on the radar, we said, okay, if you think it's important, let, let's do it. So, and, and now we will have this group. And I think that is one way how to do it. And we need to find a way and, and the way also you are doing it, reaching out to many companies and getting them the feedback from the companies and bringing this to the industrial form is something which I consider very important. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, they say that uh, uh, necessity is the motherhood of invention. And uh, it was nice to see the community stand up and take their responsibility. Uh, thank you very much for that answer. Uh, Vincenzo, uh, I'm just looking at the time. We've got a we, few more minutes. We have, we have a few more minutes, indeed. A few more minutes. Yeah. Um, so f first of all, uh, let me just say that uh, uh, we were very happy from, from our side because we, uh, Sesimo is a part, uh, member of the Industrial Forum. And so we were very happy that, and one of the main promoter of this uh, request for the additional working group. So we were very happy that uh, this was taken into consideration. Um, and, um, also, uh, very quickly to, uh, to follow up on what Pantea mentioned about uh, how can we recognize uh, the, uh, the, the, the effort of companies like Equinor that are using additive manufacturing. I think the, uh, the product sustainability initiative and the right to repair uh, initiative are two uh, major uh, opportunities to give uh, recognition to, uh, to companies using additive manufacturing. Going uh, to the questions we, we have at the moment, uh, we, have, uh, we had a lot of uh, uh, requ uh, um, requests or let's say po uh, questions pointing out that uh, there is a gap uh, in between uh, standards development and also funding available for standards uh, at EU level. Uh, so um, maybe, uh, uh, let's say, addressing uh, this question to both uh, representatives from uh, the Commission, how do you see, uh, let's say, the, the, the promotion and the funding of, uh, of standards uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the next Horizon Europe, uh, uh, so in the Horizon Europe uh, program, and how can we make sure that uh, these two things are aligned? If I can come in very quickly on this, because I will soon need to, to switch back to another meeting. Um, that is, um, uh, for example, we just had a, a discussion um, also internally in, in the Commission. We are, we are coordinating, of course, uh, the input uh, for industry. And uh, our colleagues from uh, DG Research and Innovation were very interested to hear that there is this um, ta uh, task force now from the Industrial Forum, and particularly the colleagues uh, coming from, from uh, Horizon Cluster 4, which is uh, Digital Industry and Space. And uh, I said, you definitely should be part of this uh, task force on advanced manufacturing, and I think that is where we then need to learn about your, your needs uh, and, and if there is a concrete need which you can point out on the standardization and the funding gap. Uh, I think it would be important to have this pretty quickly because we start now the uh, discussions on the work program 23-24 because now the work program 21-22 has been just launched. Uh, so there, I, 
there are also opportunities, but I think also now the discussion as they start on 23, 24 is also the moment to, to highlight these needs. And I think that's why then also using uh, this group uh, is, is, is a good vehicle to transport these messages. And the more concrete you can be and the, the more helpful this will be then for the input into the work programs. Thank you. A very, one very last question, uh, I think, uh, uh, addressed more for uh, our uh, uh, in, indus, industrial uh, uh, representative. Uh, you both mentioned uh, uh, the business models. So what business model we need? And uh, one of the participants was wondering, like, what do we need uh, uh, to, uh, to make this shift happens in business model? And uh, uh, is it more uh, like a, a shift from usage of product uh, to uh, owning it? Or, uh, and how can we, let's say, uh, involve the SMEs uh, into this uh, uh, discussion? Maybe I will just answer on that, uh, just also put the comment in the chat. So what we are doing, and uh, of course, we see that, that there is also move from owning to, let's say, uh, to owning system to, uh, uh, which is also a CapEx related topic to more OPEX related. So, and that's why we are also offering rental leasing options. And what we are now also piloting, as mentioned, is a, a business model, new business model, which are more focused on the usage. So um, this is a so-called pay-per-use model. So that is all also um, how we think uh, we could support, especially in this SMEs, um, in order to drive also CAPEX-related topics and issues. Uh, I can also mention just one thing. If we are shifting from owning to using, I would like to look at the sustainability effect of that. So. If the supplier actually own the whole <clears throat> life of the product and the user only use this, so what is going to happen is that that product need to be quite efficient when it's come to the efficiency. So using electricity, living longer and be repairable should be part of that. And at the end of the lifetime of that product, the owner or the, <clears throat> the supplier need to make sure that this product is going to be re recycled at the end of the time. So what is going to happen is that instead of having this model of going to, toward the obsolete and, and sell more, they want to actually make sure that this product live longer, is repairable and is recyclable. So just by shifting that, we can have quite a big effect on the uh, on the sustainability metrics there. So I think this is this is quite a big uh, big change for the industry if moving toward this. Thank you. Um, I think uh, we we have let's say went be, uh, beyond uh, the time uh, for a couple of minutes. So uh, from from my side, I would say. Uh, thank you very much to all the panelists. Thank you, Stuart, for the great moderation and uh, for the opening. Thank you, Ms. Engelman, to uh, to give us these uh, very 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 nice insights on the on the industrial forum and uh, the activities of the Commission. Also from uh, Maurits for your uh, uh, for for your great uh, overview of the industrial strategy and. Uh, obviously, from from our point of view, it was great to see uh, two uh, uh, let's say pioneers in the in the three in the three D printing uh, industry like EOS and uh, USE like uh, uh, Eginor, uh, giving us all this uh, information that we will definitely reuse in our uh, uh, messages and uh, and, uh, and and the, in the future activities. With this, uh, I would say uh, we can close this webinar and uh, thanks for all the participants and everything will be uh, shared with the participants from presentation and recordings in the following days. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Stay safe. Bye.